Can we see me? Can we hear me? Always got to be the first question. Because God knows the answer is not always yes. Hey, you can see me, you can hear me. In that case. Okay, good. For, for a split second, I was like, oh, something hitched. We're fine, which means I'm Brittany, this is Sheely Ann, and welcome to Gay Watch, where we watch gay things. Today, we are continuing our journey into Volume 1 of Heaven Official's Blessing. I have seen Season 1 of the Donghua, but I have not read this book. So this is very much a reading reaction situation over any kind of like professional audiobook or like reading thing. This is exactly what a reading reaction sounds like, you know? You get the, you know, yeah. So, <clears throat> we were on page, oh, 250 or 251. One of these days I'll remember to find the place we left off before I start the live stream. But today is not that day. Because even with a bookmark, you know, between two pages, you can still look for a while. But uh, that's fine. We usually give a couple of minutes for people to get the notification that Gay Watch is live and hop on in if they can. So in the meantime, in the meantime, what? In the meantime, how is everyone today? Today, if you live in America, today are the midterm elections. If you are registered, and in some cases you can get same day registered, please, please, please go vote. Go vote today. The wife is getting off work and coming to pick me up, and we are going to vote. Please, for the love of God, go vote. That is all I'm going to say about it. Just go vote, please. Thank you. Now, ooh, Jessica Anderson has already voted. Congratulations. Did you have... Like, was it easy? Did you have a line? I'm very fortunate. I'm in a district that doesn't really have a line at my voting place. It's really easy getting in and out. I know there are a lot of horror stories in a, in a lot of districts about, you know, super long wait times and all that jazz. But I'm very fortunate in mine. It's pretty easy. <sighs> it's Francesca's first time hopping in on one of these live streams. Welcome, welcome. We are in chapter... Oh, shit. It just says the title of the chapter, not the number. I think seven. 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 I bu yeah? Yeah? Seven? No? All right. Um, I can tell you, yeah, it's page 250, 251. And now I really do have to figure out where the heck we left off. Let me see. I believe, ah, I believe you're on 251. We were towards the bottom of 250, actually. I'm going to go ahead and start, I should really make a note on which line I leave off. Why did I not think about that until just now? Would literally solve all my problems. I feel like I could blame ADD for this. So I'm going to blame ADD for this. Ba -ba -ba. At any rate, I'm going to start towards the top of 250. Yeah, see, I thought we left off on the snake, like, arriving. Um, top of 250. I meant bottom of 250. My bad. Starting off towards the bottom of 250 to get a little bit of run in before the snake appears. So, 
if this is your first time here, actually, you know, catching us live, or your first time just hopping in on this live stream, uh, we read for a bit, We then we have a bit of a break about halfway through, and then we come back for a part two of more reading. We usually get through about 40 pages, um, and we are actually, especially after today, we're closing in on the end. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. I am going to read ahead of the Donghua. That was not originally the plan. But I was making out my schedule the other day for when exactly this is going to come up. January is for volume four of Moda Zushi. But then February will be for volume two of Heaven Official's Blessing. And then I think March is going to be for volume three of Heaven Official's Blessing. Don't quote me on that, but I believe two and three are going to come back to back. I'm pretty sure how that, that that's how that worked out. But I'll look at it again, obviously. I'll let you guys know. I know that February is Heaven Official's Blessing, Volume 2. <sighs> so, towards the bottom of 250, reading that Stone Stelay, another word that really tripped me up. <coughs> ah, yes. Sometimes I cough. It's an asthma thing left over from when I had asthma when I was a kid. There's not much I can do about it other than point my head away from the mic when it happens. I, there, this just, it's just one of those things. So my apologies for the interruptions. I try to minimize it as best I can. All righty. Towards the bottom of 250. Oh, which means it's a nice clean, uh, nice clean addition today. We should be stopping around 290, whatever that means for the people who have already read this in terms of trying to see what we're going to cover today. But now let's go ahead and get started. Shilian looked back at the stone stele and saw it was indeed the end of the epitaph, and there were no more words. He had been feeling a bit woeful, but now he thought it funny. He whispered back, Why are you so mischievous? Senlong stuck out his tongue, and the two chuckled. Just then, someone streaked, What's this? Streaked? Shrieked? What's this? The shriek echoed in the cave, sharply reverberating against the walls, and it caused all their hairs to stand up. Shilian instantly turned toward where the shriek came from and demanded, What happened? Where the merchants were once prostrating, everyone had jumped up in a flash and scurried away in fear and alarm. Snake! Nanfang and Fu Yao moved their palms toward the commotion and lit up the ground in that direction. Curled on the sandy floor was a slender, brilliantly colored snake. And this is where I tap out. We're not, I don't, I don't do snakes. Just, just so we're all aware. Me and snakes? No. Why is there a snake? My question exactly. The crowd was growing increasingly anxious. How, how did this snake not make any noise? We didn't hear when it slithered over at all. I mean, snakes are usually pretty quiet when they slither, slither over, unless they've got like a tail rattle thing happening. <coughs> unless there's some weird snake noise that I don't know about. When the flames appeared near the snake, it instantly became alert and raised itself into an attack position. Nanfeng was about to torch it when someone leisurely strolled over. That person easily snatched the snake with his left hand, clutching it at its heart. He brought it closer to observe it and said, Isn't it normal to see snakes in the desert? Someone that fearlessly gutsy was, of course, Senlong. They say to fight a snake, seize it at the heart. If pressed there hard enough, no matter how venomous its fangs, it'll be helpless. The snake wrapped its long tail around Senlong's left arm meekly. At closer range, Shilian could see clearly the snake had translucent skin, and its vivid red insides were visible and mixed with threads of black, resembling organs. Rather disgusting! The tail was the color of flesh and segmented with layers of hard shell, unlike that of a snake, more like a scorpion. What the fuck is this thing? That was me, not anything in the book. Seeing this, Shilian's face changed, and he called out, Watch out for its tail! 
Before Shi Lian finished speaking, the long, the long snake body wrapped around San Lung's left arm su and suddenly let go. The emphasis was all over that slobble. Let's try that again. Before Shi Lian finished speaking, the long snake body wrapped around San Lung's left arm suddenly let go. The tail snapped backward and tried to stab viciously towards San Lung. Venomous as the tail was, San Lung's right hand was faster, and he easily caught it. Now holding both head and tail, San Lung showed off the snake to Shi Lian like it was an interesting toy, laughing. This tail's pretty interesting. On the end of the tail, there was a long, flesh red needle. Shi Lian sighed in relief. I'm glad you weren't stung, as I thought, this is a scorpion snake. Who the fuck invents a scorpion snake? Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Nenfeng and Fu Yao approached to observe the snake too. Scorpion snake? That's right, Shi Lian said. It's a kind of venomous vermin found only in Banyue. They're very rare. I've never seen one before, but I've heard of them. Body of a snake, tail of a scorpion, its venom has the strength of both combined, and if bitten or stung, Shi Lian trailed off. God, see, yeah, you know why that's cursed? You know why scorpion snake is cursed? Because that basically puts needles at both ends. And one of the most terrifying things about snakes is that they have literally two long needles coming out of their mouths. And of course, the thing about scorpions is they have a fucking needle on their tail. So now, and I hate fucking needles. So you're talking about needles at both ends? Fuck you, that's cursed. That is cursed as hell. He watched, <laughs> he watched Sen Lung twisting the snake, pulling and squeezing it as if it were a towel, stopping just short of tying it into a bow. Shi Lian was speechless for a moment, then gently chided, Sen Lung, stop playing with the poor thing, it's dangerous. Sen Lung laughed, don't worry, Gaga, it's nothing. The scorpion snake is the totem of the Banyue state preceptor. Gotta take this rare chance to examine it. Shi Lian blinked, the totem of the Banyue state preceptor? That's right, Sen Lung said. Apparently, it was because the state preceptor could control these scorpion snakes that the people of Banyue believed in her infinite powers and worshipped her. Hearing the word control alarmed Shi Lian. When it came to controlling anything, whatever it might be, they usually came in huge numbers. Oh. He immediately cried, Everyone, leave this cave! There may be more than one scorpion snake! Before he could finish, there came a wail. Snake! Other voices started yelling, so many snakes! Over here, too! From the shadows, seven or eight scorpion snakes soundlessly slithered into the cave. They came so swiftly and quietly from unknown crevices, but they didn't attack, only watched, judging. Soundless in both movement and attack, not even hissing, truly extremely dangerous. Nanfeng and Fu Yao released two fireballs and shot them toward the snakes, and a large ball of fire exploded inside the cave. Get out! Shi Lian yelled. No one needed to be told twice, and everyone ran outside. Luckily, it was still light out, and the twister had long passed. The wind calmed. The group of them escaped into open ground and kept running. As they ran, someone said, the stone memorial, <clears throat> that stone memorial is too scary. How come after we count out three times, we still ran into stuff like that? Shi Lian was thankful that they didn't know those last words were fabricated by San Lung. But then he heard someone else say, Yeah, it's pretty much the same effect as worshipping the scrap immortal. The more you pray, the unluckier you become. Aww. Even when the issue was barely related to him, he still got shot. Shi Lian was speechless. Suddenly, Tian Cheng yelped in alarm. Uncle Zheng! That elder he had been assisting had collapsed. Shi Lian darted over. Oh, God, did we need art of the snakes? Did, did we, did, was that necessary? Okay. Hang on. What happened? Pain filled the... Pain filled the face of old man Zheng, and he raised a shaky hand. Shi Lian grabbed hold of his hand and frowned, his heart sinking. 
There was a growing, angry swelling spreading rapidly down his palm, and within the red and purple bruising, there were two small punctures, barely visible. A wound that tiny would not have otherwise been noticed until it was too late. Everyone, check and see if you have any wounds on your bodies, Shelian called out immediately. If you do, use a rope to stop the spread. Shelian turned the hand over to examine his meridians and saw that the red and purple swelling was visibly climbing up the veins of the arm. What a formidable venom, Shelian thought. He was just about to unravel Roye when, next to him, Ajao ripped a, ripped a strip of fabric from his own clothing and promptly knotted it tightly around the old man's bicep to prevent the venom from progressing. Shelian mentally praised him. He looked up, and without needing him to say anything, Nenfeng had already taken out a medicine bottle and popped out a pill. Shilian helped the old man swallow it. Uncle, are you okay? Tianchen cried. Haja who? Ajauge. Ajauge. Uncle won't die, will he? Ajau shook his head. To be bitten by the scorpion snake means certain death within four hours. Tianchen was shaken. Then, what do we do? That's my cat. Hi! You're literally standing right over there! Yeah! Come over here! There we go! I can't lift you up because I'm reading, but I can pet you from here. I would lift him up to show you guys, but I cannot. Maybe he'll hop up on the side. He likes to hop up on the side of the chair a lot. Or he will... Wow! I think he darted out of the room so fast I didn't even see. He did. That was a somewhat cameo. From my cat, everyone. He is a gray menace. He will probably return. Now, I've entirely... Ah, yes. To be bitten by the scorpion snake means certain death within four hours. Tiangsheng was Shervan, and the other merchants also started panicking. Oh, ha, ha. Okay. OBS dipped out for a second. But it reconnected, so you guys may have noticed a little stutter or what have you, but it reconnected and everything should be fine. Everything else looks good, actually. Yes. So, Tang Sheng was shaken. Then, what do we do? I mean, Old Man Zheng was the leader of the caravan, and the other merchants also started panicking. Our friend here just gave him a pill, right? That wasn't an antidote, Nanfeng said. It's for temporary longevity. The most it can give him is 24 hours. The crowd became even more distressed. Only 24 hours? Oh, ha <laughs> ha. I almost forgot to show you the cursed images of the snakes. I mean, granted, they aren't rendered in... Whoa, hello. Um, terrific detail, which is nice. Very kind. Thank you, illustrator. But still, that's a terrifying thought. That's, that's fucking awful. That who no that I don't we don't mm -mm, no 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 thank you that's nightmare fuel no Whew. only 24 hours does that mean we can only sit here and wait for death to come is there no saving him from this venom right then Senlong walked over slowly there is a way everyone turned to stare at him Tian Chung turned his head joyously Jaga, if there's a way, then why didn't you say so? Gave me a fright. However, Ajao stayed silent and shook his head. Of course it's not easy for him to say, Sanlong said. How could he possibly tell you that the Bitten One can only be saved at the cost of everyone else's lives? Sanlong, what do you mean? Shilian asked. Gaga, do you know the story behind the scorpion snake? Sanlong asked. In the legends, many hundreds of years ago, there was once a king of Banyue who, while hunting, inadvertently caught two spirits born from two venomous creatures, one snake and one scorpion. The two venom spirits cultivated deep within the mountains, ignorant of the world and causing no afflictions. Nevertheless, the king considered their nature and believed they would cause evil sooner or later, so he decided to execute them. They begged and begged for their lives to be spared, but the king was cruel. He forced the two creatures to mate in front of him, ugh, and his ministers to serve as entertainment at one of his many banquets, and after the feast, they were executed. Only the queen 
<laughs> Only the queen pitied the two creatures, but she feared going against the will of the king, so all she could do was pick the leaf of a fragrant fern and cast it out to cover their corpses. The snake and scorpion became vengeful spirits, immensely resentful, and they cursed the descendants born from their mating to forever remain in the kingdom of Banyue to destroy its people. Ever since then, scorpion snakes were found only within Banyue territory. Should anyone be bitten or stung, the venom would spread through their body like wildfire, and they would die a miserable death. However, thanks to that one act of kindness by the queen, the fern leaves used to cover their corpses became the antidote for their venom. That plant is called Shenyue, and it only grows within the borders of Banyue. Senlong finished. Is, is the legend true? Can it be believed? The merchants asked anxiously. Buddy, this concerns life and death. Don't joke around with us. Senlung smiled, but said nothing, refusing to speak more after telling Xilian the tale. Tian Chung turned toward Ajao. Jaga, is, is what that red-clad Gaga said true? After a moment of hesitation, Ajao replied, Whether the legend is true, I do not know. But the Shenyue plant does grow within the walls of Banyue, and it is indeed the antidote for the scorpion snake venom. Meaning the only way to live after getting bitten is to venture into the kingdom of Banyue, Shilian asked. No wonder so many caravans passed through Banyue territory despite knowing the deadly rumors. It wasn't that they were defiant and stubbornly went to seek their own deaths, but rather that if they didn't go, they would most certainly die. The scorpion snake was the totem of the evil master of Banyue, and she also controlled them. The appearance of these snakes was no mere coincidence. With only a few heavenly officials like them here, there was no way they could ensure the absolute safety of the entire merchant group, and there was no telling how many more snakes would show. Shilian raised two fingers and pressed them against his temple, trying to connect with the heavenly communication array to see if he could shamelessly borrow more junior officials. No dice. He couldn't connect to the array, couldn't reach out at all. Shilian lowered his hand and wondered, I didn't use up all my spiritual powers, did I? I calculated this morning, and there was still a little bit left. He turned to Nanfeng and Fu Yao. Can either of you try to enter the communication array? I'm getting no connection. After a moment, the other two also looked grim. I can't get in either, Nanfeng said. There were cases where the connection would become fuzzy near highly evil auras, or as potent enough to diminish the powers of various heavenly officials, and sometimes cut them off completely. It seemed that, that was the situation they were in now. Shilian paced back and forth and wondered out loud, it might be because we're too close to the kingdom of Banyue, so the communication array is blocked. Just then, in the corner of his eye, there was a flash of red. Nenfeng and Fu Yao were busy trying to reconnect with the communication array, and everyone else was occupied checking for wounds on their bodies. The boy Tian Sheng was anxiously holding tightly onto Old Man Zheng and didn't notice a wine-red scorpion snake soundlessly climbing up his spine, curling near the neck, and opening its mouth. However, the fangs were not aiming at Tian Sheng's neck, but at San Lung's right arm, San Lung's arm right next to it. The snake leaned back, then pounced. In the speed of a second, before the snake had the chance to sink its fangs into Senlung, Shilian's hand shot out and snatched it right at the heart with blinding precision. Given his strength, Shilian could crush the snake's heart if he wanted to, rupture its innards, and spill its insides. But not knowing whether the snake's flesh was also poisonous, he didn't dare to press harder. Shilian raised his other hand to grab for the tail, but the snake was slippery and artful, making it difficult to catch. Shilian squeezed, but he only felt something soft and cold slither away from his fingers. The next moment, a sharp needle pain flared from the back of his hand. The scorpion tail. After the sting, Shilian snatched the tail and captured the snake properly, then squeezed down hard until it fell unconscious. Even having been stung, Shilian's face never changed and he tossed the unconscious snake onto the ground indifferently. Everyone be careful, there may be more snakes around. He felt a tight grip on his wrist before he finished and looked to see that it was Sen Lung who caught hold of him. Sen Lung, Shilian was slightly taken aback. The reason he sounded confused was because, 
At that moment, the expression on the youth's face was off. It was unexplainable, frosty almost to the point of being frightening. His eyes were focused intently on the tiny wounds on the back of Shelian's hand. The wounds themselves were originally the size of needle punctures, but the venom was vicious. The back of his hand had immediately swelled up angrily with a large patch of purpley red, and those, small, and those small puncture wounds had visibly enlarged to the size of knife cuts. With a dark expression, Senlong wordlessly snatched Royer from Shilian's arm and immediately knotted it firmly on his wrist. We love hand interaction, preventing the venom from advancing. While Royer enjoyed snuggling up to Shilian, it wasn't normally that well behaved. And yet, in Sanlong's hands, it was so compliant, it was like it was dead. I mean, when the pet really takes to the guy, that's a trope we all know and love. For all the time they'd known each other, Shilian had never seen Sanlon look like this. For all the time they'd known each other? How long have they known each other now? How long has it been? It ha not that long. Not that long at all. <coughs> he opened his mouth to speak, but Senlong turned to pull a dagger off the waist of one of the merchants. Nanfeng saw and knew instantly what Senlong was about to do, and he ignited a palm torch. Without sparing a look, Senlong burned the tip of the dagger to disinfect it before turning back to Xilian and drawing a cross over the puncture wound. Just as he was about to lower his head to the hand, Xilian hurriedly said, It's okay. The venom is aggressive. Sucking it won't do much. I don't want you to get poisoned. Senlong ignored Xilian's protests, tightened his hold on Xilian's hand, and placed his lips upon it. Xilian felt his own arm tremble slightly, and he couldn't explain why. At least not right now. That was me. That wasn't the book. Next to him, Fuyo said in disdain, I can't believe you went and got yourself stung. What were you doing catching the snake when the kid might not have been bitten, have even been bitten? You're just causing unnecessary trouble. That was true. Now that Xilian thought back to the airy way Senlong played with the snake in the cave, he probably wouldn't have even cared about an attack and would have easily avoided being bitten. But just in case, just in case Senlong didn't notice the snake in time, then wouldn't it be too late? For regrets? <sighs> Shilian waved his good hand. Don't worry, it's not like it hurts, and I won't die from it. You're really not in pain? Fuyao asked. Really, I don't feel pain anymore, Shilian answered honestly. His words were true. Shilian was someone who possessed the worst of luck. So when he ventured deep into the mountains, eight times out of ten he would step on vipers or run into venomous insects and get bitten, stung, jabbed, or poisoned in thousands one second, of ways. There is art on this page. And um, they're really just giving us what we want. Because there is actually specific art of this moment. Thank you, illustrators gotta be one of us they've been new however he'd always been very stubborn at not dying and at most he'd run a fever after three days and three nights of fever he'd wake up right as rain and continue on as if nothing had happened he simply wasn't sensitive to pain so as much as it hurt he could live with it Right after he said this, Senlong finally looked up. The red swelling on the back of Xilian's hand had gone down, and Senlong's lips were stained with blood. Listen, I just got done watching Interview with the Vampire. We, I, that's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. You know, you know. His eyes were extremely cold. 
and he moved his glare to the unconscious snake on the ground. There was a loud boom, and the snake abruptly exploded into a purplish-red pool of blood and flesh. This was literally just the tiniest example of how you don't fuck with Shilian. Nobody ever since San Long showed up fucking with Shilian in like any way is just going to get you exploded. And I love how they started with a scorpion snake to illustrate the point. And then I am sure there will be many examples throughout this insanely long series. Whew. The sudden blast surprised everyone, but no one knew who did it. Even if the blood didn't splatter onto anyone, there was still a feeling of unease blanketing the crowd. Tian Sheng, remembering that Shi Lian had also been stung, asked worriedly, Kuka, you got stung too. What will you do? Shi Lian felt the bandage on his wrist and smiled. Don't worry, little one. We'll stick to the plan of going to the Benue ruins and searching for the Shenue fern. Another merchant asked, You guys are going? What about us? Should we send someone to go with you? You can all stay here. Benue territory is dangerous. The more people there, the more mishaps can happen. We will find the fern and bring it back to you within 24 hours, Shilian said. W will you really? Thank you so much. How could we possibly ever... A number of the merchants started stuttering their thanks, but then their faces changed when Shilian continued to speak. In order to reach Benue as soon as possible, I want to borrow your guide temporarily, if that's all right. Naturally, Shilian meant Ajao. The merchants went from grateful and relieved to largely hesitant. Shilian knew where they were coming from. They were afraid that Shilian might run off with their guide once he found the Shenwei fern, or even if Ajao didn't run away, he would still be greatly delayed. Nevertheless, none of them wanted to venture into that wicked place where at least half go missing, so it was a huge dilemma. Their worries were perfectly normal, so Shilian quickly added, and just in case anything else comes to attack you, Fu Yao will stay until we return. With one man staying, the merchants finally agreed and nodded. All right, as long as Ajao is willing to go with you. Shilian turned to Ajao. Are you open to lending us a hand, my friend? If not, that's okay too. Ajao nodded and said, yes, but the Banyue ruins are actually not hard to get to. Just keep going in this direction and you'll reach them. After bidding the merchants farewell, Ajao took the lead with Shilian, Senlung, and Nunfeng following right behind. A while later, Shilian inquired, Ajao, do the scorpion snakes appear frequently in this area? Not frequently. This is my first time seeing them, too, Ajao replied. Shilian nodded and had no more questions. Truthfully, he did live in the Banyue area for a number of years, and this was also his first time seeing a scorpion snake. Ajao's answer was not surprising. Nenfeng realized Shilian's intentions and asked in a low voice, You're suspicious of this, Ajao? Shilian responded in a whisper, Either way, we've brought him out. Just keep an eye on him. Ooh, see? One of the greatest things about Shi Lian is, like, he's not a fucking idiot, you know? Like, he's so kind. He's happy-go-lucky. He's got some sass. But, like, he's not an idiot. In the past, we're at the top of page 264, by the way. In the past, it was usually San Lang who would talk to him first. Shilian wasn't sure if it was because of the incident earlier, but the youth still looked rather upset, walking without speaking a word. Shilian couldn't figure out what was going on and didn't know how to talk to him, so he kept on walking as well. The four continued to trek through the vast Gobi Desert for close to an hour. The windstorm had long since passed, and without any obstructions, they advanced quickly. Soon they could see ragged weeds here and there, growing in cracks in the rock and sand. By the time the sun was setting, Shilian finally spotted an ancient walled city on the horizon. The city was difficult to see, but it was the color of sand, camouflaged by the yellow, so it became one with the desert. Some parts of the city walls were caved in and buried in the sand. As they approached, they found that the walls were extremely high, towering over 30 meters. It wasn't hard to imagine the city's past magnificence. Magnificence. How grand it must have been. Passing through the Barbican, the four formally entered the kingdom of Banyue. Past the gates was a wide and empty city street, with dilapidated houses on each side 
and rotten beams and broken bricks strewn about. Perhaps out of habit, Ajao cautioned the others. Please be careful and don't leave the group on your own. The other three didn't need that reminder. The actual Banyue city was far different from what they'd imagined. Nanfeng wondered, this is the kingdom of Banyue? It's smaller than a capital. A desert country is only as big as the oasis it's built on, Shilian explained. At its peak, the population was only about 10,000. It was actually pretty lively in a small city like this. Nanfeng continued to observe the surroundings. It would probably only take a few days to siege a country of this size. Shilian shook his head. Not necessarily. Don't underestimate the people of Banyue, Nanfeng. Even if their population wasn't more than 10,000, they kept the number of soldiers at an average of 4,000. There were more men than women. Aside from the sick and old and the farmers, most men joined the army. Besides, the majority of those soldiers were over three meters tall, each more violent than the next. With maces in hand, they would keep fighting even with swords through their chests. They were very hard to fight. Ajao seemed rather surprised and glanced at Xilian. This young master seems to know a lot. Xilian maintained his smile and was about to converse some more when Nanfeng posed a question. What's that wall? He was indicating a giant yellow earthen building in the far distance. Building wasn't quite the right word to describe it. It was a giant enclosure formed by four massive mud-colored walls, with neither doors nor a roof. Each wall was over 30 meters, and on the very top there was a pole with something tattered attached, flying in the wind. It was a chilling image. Shilian turned his head and glanced, then said simply, That's the sinner's pit. Sure. By the sound of the name alone, it was obvious it wasn't anything good. Sinner's pit? Nanfeng frowned. Humming gravely, Shilian explained, you can think of it as a jail. It was made specifically for imprisoning criminals. How does it imprison anyone if there isn't even a door? Throw them in from the top? Nanfeng wondered. Xilian was hesitating to answer when Sanlung suddenly spoke up. They do get thrown in, and the pit is full of venomous snakes and starving beasts. Xilian was relieved to finally hear them speak, but when he looked over to Sanlung, the boy met his gaze and turned away. Nenfeng swore, that's no fucking jail, that's torture. How cruel. The people of Banyue were either sick in the head or savage psychos. Judgmental, but also like... Shilian rubbed his forehead. Not all of them were like that. Some were quite endearing. He paused suddenly, his brows furrowing. Wait. The other three stopped and Shilian pointed upward. Look at that pole above the pit. Is that a person hanging from it? In the dimming light of the setting sun, and at such a distance, it was difficult to see what exactly was hanging from the pole. But going closer and scrutinizing the shape, it became obvious that it was a scrawny little person in black, their clothes unkempt, dangling in the wind like a rag doll. It's a person, Sanlun confirmed. When Ajao saw the hanging person, his face paled. This was such a bizarre, anguishing display that even a calm individual like him couldn't bear the sight of it. Just then, Sanlong tilted his head and said in a low voice, Someone's here. He wasn't the only one who noticed. Shilian also heard feather-light footsteps approaching. The four immediately moved to hide them in, the, in the many decaying houses on the roadside. Shilian and Sanlong entered one house, and then Feng and Ajao hid in the one across the street. Soon after, at the end of the broken street, the female cultivator in white appeared. The woman was dressed in a pale white robe with a whisk tucked in her arm, the garb of a Taoist preset, priestess. What's going on with my mouth lately? She roamed along the street, peering here and there. Her eyes were bright and observant, as if she were in her own backyard garden and not the Banyue ruins. Strolling right behind her was another woman clad in black, her hands clasped behind her back. The black-clad woman was beautiful, yet cold. Her eyes were piercing, her raven hair long and free, and it was like she radiated chill from her very person. Although she was walking behind the female cultivator, no one would mistake her for a subordinate. These were the same two they'd seen outside the abandoned inn at noon. 
At that time, they had passed by too fast, and Chilean couldn't make out the details of the lady in black, but now he saw clearly that she was indeed a woman. If the one in white was the state preceptor of Banue, who was the one in black? The state preceptor swished her whisk leisurely and spoke, Now where did they go? We were careless for one moment, and they all disappeared. Do I have to dig them out and kill them one by one? Just as Shilian thought, they were being watched from the moment they stepped foot into the city. The lady in black approached and stoically said, said, You can call your friends to help you kill them. By friends, she must have meant the soldiers of Banue. The state preceptor of Banue laughed. Ha! <laughs> I don't like calling other people. I like calling you. Aren't you glad? I mean, how much do you like calling her? You know what I'm saying? The lady in black ignored her completely and said coolly, There's nothing agreeable about being called out by the likes of you for something like this. Just go. The state preceptor of Banue arched her brows, but still sped away. Listening to them, it sounded as if they were close. They were no ordinary folks, so the lady in black must be someone of renown. Someone who would be close to, to the state preceptor of Banue? A mysterious fellow cultivator? Or was there a queen or general they didn't know about? Shilian was trying to connect the dots rapidly in his mind, but he held his breath. Now wasn't the time to be discovered. It looked like the state preceptor had an unpredictable personality. If she should find them and excitedly summon her legendary nine-foot-tall, mace-wielding Banue soldiers, more time would be wasted fighting them. Twenty-four hours. One hour wasted was another hour they'd sunk deeper into danger. But there was no helping this bad luck. Whatever he didn't want to happen would always happen. The lady in black was passing the house she lay and hid in, but stopped mid-step, and her piercing gaze swept over the decayed shelter. The state preceptor of Banue was already farther ahead, but she noticed that her companion had stopped and came back around. Hey, are you coming? The lady in black didn't look at her. You! Step back. All right, the state preceptor responded obediently and actually retreated. The lady, the lady in black was about to raise her hand when suddenly a loud rumble blasted from across the street. On the other side, the house Nanfeng and Ajao had hidden in had collapsed. The crumbling of one house led the entire row to cave in. Dust and sand rolled into the air and clouded the whole street. Within that cloud, a black shadow leapt out and shot a streaming flame toward the state preceptor, but the lady in black rushed forward and shielded her from harm. With her left hand still behind her, she flipped her right palm and easily absorbed the flames before reflecting them right back. The black shadow parried her while escaping and soon disappeared. The state preceptor immediately chased after that shadow, but the lady in black gave the house behind another sweeping look before following. Bless you, Nanfeng, Shi Lian thanked mentally. Everything happened so quickly, but Nanfeng had no doubt known somehow that they were about to be in trouble and created a diversion to lead their enemies astray. He was the only one who leapt out, so A Zhao must still be inside the collapsed house. After making sure the state preceptor and the lady in black were indeed gone, Shi Lian dragged San Lung out of their hiding spot and called out, A Zhao, are you still alive? Are you hurt anywhere? A moment later, a muffled voice came from under the ruins. I'm fine. Shilian was relieved. Thank goodness. Although Shilian trusted Nanfeng's ability to, ability, uh, Nanfeng's ability to control the crash and that he would no doubt leave enough space for A Zhao to stay safe, it was still more reassuring to see it with his own eyes. He raised one of the rotten beams with one hand and after a moment, Ajao emerged from underneath, covered in dust from head to toe. He brushed himself off a bit and returned to his stoic expression. Now there are only three of us left, Shi Lian said. Nanfeng is creating a diversion, so we must move faster. Do you know where we can find the Shenyue Fern, Ajao? The young man shook his head and said, Sorry, I only know where the city is, but I've never been here before, so I don't know where the fern can be found. Sun Long spoke up. They say the Shanyue fern prefers shade. It is small, its roots thin, but its leaves are big, like a heart-shaped peach. Why not search near a large building? A large building? Shilian contemplated. If they were talking big, there was no building larger than the palace. 
In the legend, it was after the festivities that the queen picked a chenue leaf, which could mean the fern grew on the palace grounds. The three moved their gaze afar, and in the center of the city there was indeed a palace built of brick and wood. From a distance, the palace had a grandiose aura, but upon a closer look, it was not in much better shape than the dilapidated houses on the streets. Though the palace gates there was a, through the palace gates there was a massive garden. Perhaps in the past it wasn't a garden, but a palace square. With years of neglect, weeds had flourished and spread. Indeed, it wasn't sand beneath their feet now, but mud. This was most likely the last sign of the oasis that once was, and the Shenyue fern could very well be growing among all other plants. Let's not waste time, Shilian said. We only have 24 hours, but keep an eye out for scorpion snakes. Ajao and Senlung both hummed in acknowledgement and lowered their heads to start searching through the plants. As they rummaged, it suddenly occurred to Shilian that if the state preceptor of Banyue could control scorpion snakes, there should be an abundance of them slithering about in her territory. Ever since they entered the city, they hadn't seen a single snake. He straightened up and was about to speak when one of his hands fell on a long object. Looking down, <laughs> looking down again, he found that it was a human leg. Ah! Shilian withdrew his hand and was struck speechless. It occurred to him that every time he was faced with some horrifying incident or saw or touched anything frightening in the dark, it was always the other party who would scream before he could say anything. But shouldn't it be the other way around? The plants in this garden were tall and thick, and whoever's leg Shilian had touched was someone who had already been hiding and crawling in the weeds. The moment they touched, the leg recoiled, and the weeds in front of him rustled. Someone called out, Don't hit me! Don't hit me! Gaga, it's me! Shilian scrutinized the wild grass and saw that the one who emerged crying, Don't hit me! was thick-browed, large-eyed Tian Sheng. The boy in turn saw that Shilian recognized him and sighed a breath of relief. Shilian, on the other hand, wasn't relieved. Rather, he became even more alarmed and raised his good arm in a defensive stance. In circumstances like these, it was more likely that this was an illusion created by something evil. Weren't you with the others back in the desert? How are you here? Are you really Tian Sheng? Tian Cheng explained hurriedly, It's me! I'm the real thing! I'm not the only one! Three other uncles also came! They're just inside! Look if you don't believe me! He pointed toward the inside of the palace, and sure enough, three men came running out. They were indeed the men from the caravan. When they saw Xi Lian, they froze in their dash and looked awkward. <laughs> Xi Lian puffed out a breath before finally rising to his feet and dusting off his white sleeves. What's going on? The merchants looked at each other, and no one made any noise. It was Tian Cheng who spoke up after an awkward silence. Gaga, after you guys left, Uncle Jung's pain flared up, and he was really miserable. We didn't know how much longer we should wait for you to return, and we were afraid that you guys might have gotten lost. Uh, hmm. Ajauga said to go straight to get to the kingdom of Banyue, so we thought the more hands to help the better, so... So what he really meant was that the merchants regretted letting them go after all. They were afraid that Shilian and company would rob them of their guide after finding the Shenyue fern for themselves, so they sent people to come follow them. Shilian imagined that Fu Yao couldn't persuade them otherwise, and was probably also too lazy to hold them back. It was impossible to stop stubborn people who refused to listen to reason. Shilian felt rather exasperated. You're all too reckless. Who knows what there might be and what might happen in a place like this? And you still came? Tian Cheng himself knew that they'd been... Woo. Tian Cheng himself knew that what they'd done made it obvious they didn't trust Xi Lian, and he felt bad. This was why he didn't make a sound while hiding in the weeds earlier, as awkward as it was. Sorry, this concerns a man's life, so he couldn't sit still. No matter. This was a life-or-death situation, and to be wary was entirely natural. To go so far into danger for an antidote also proved that they were worthy companions. Shilian couldn't continue to scold them for this, and sighed. If you didn't bump into anything weird when entering the territory, then it's your good fortune. But how did you know to come to the palace to search for the Shenyue fern? Tian Chung scratched his head and replied, We didn't know where to start, but in the story the Red Cloth Giga told, it was the queen who picked the leaves, right? The queen couldn't possibly leave the palace grounds, so I thought we'd come here and try our luck. 
Well, this child's mind could certainly spin, and it spun right on target, Shilian thought. Just then, San Lung spoke up from the side. I found it. Shilian turned to see San Lung striding with his long, lithe legs toward him. It's now really the time, Shilian? In his hands were a few turquoise-colored leaves with roots still attached to the stems. The leaves were about the size of a baby's palm and in the shape of peaches, slightly pointy at the ends, with thin, tiny roots. Even without Ajao to confirm, Shilian knew without a doubt that this must be the Shenyue fern. Without waiting for Shilian to say a word, Senlung grabbed his wounded hand and lifted it. The hand that was stung was originally frighteningly swollen, but after Senlung sucked the poison from the wound, the swelling had gone down significantly. You know what? You're already... You're, you're with me. You're with me on that joke that I could tell right now. <clears throat> That's usually what happens after sucking. With, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. with Shilian's wrist in one hand and the Shenyue fern in the other, Senlang closed his palm on the plant. After only a second, he reopened his palm, and the fern was crushed into powder without him appearing, without him appearing to exert any force. Senlang gently but firmly rubbed the powder into Shilian's hand, and he could feel coolness and relief stinging on his skin. Thanks, Senlang, Shilian said. Senlang didn't respond, however, and after applying the powder, he let go of Shilian's hand. Shilian couldn't help but think that the air between the two of them now was really strange, but he didn't know how to ask about it without sounding odd. This wasn't something anyone else would notice either, or something they could possibly understand. Hmm. Gaga, are you feeling better? Is the herb working? Tian Cheng asked anxiously. Shilian snapped out of it and replied, Much better. It should be the right herb. Hearing this, everyone became excited. Hurry, let's find more. Soon, A Zhao also raised a handful of leaves, crying out, There's more here! The Shenyue leaves in A Zhao's hands were much bigger and fuller than the small, pitiful ones Sen Lung used earlier, but the shape and markings were all correct, so everyone crowded over and happily exclaimed, there's an entire field here! So many! Pick lots! Let's pick a bunch! Do you think we can sell this? Noisily, the merchants busied themselves picking the herbs. Shilian turned his head to examine his hand for a moment, then tried to start a conversation with San Lung. You also searched the same area they're in now, right? Didn't you find any there? It was obvious Shen Shilian was trying to force a conversation, and after asking the question, he felt that he was rather pathetic. But San Lung shook his head. You shouldn't use the ferns over there. Why? She, she Lian wondered curiously. Before San Lung could answer, they heard someone scream. Go away! Everyone stopped, their movements halting. Who said that? Who's screaming? It wasn't me. It wasn't me either. Then they heard that sharp voice again. Go away! You're stepping on me! Only then did the group notice the voice came from near their feet. In a flash, the crowd retreated from that field of ferns. Seeing this, Shilian walked over. He was used to being the one in the lead when it came to these things. He approached the bush where the shrieking had come from and stripped away the thick weeds. Everyone's breathing hitched. Under the weeds, in the mud, there was a man's face. In this field, there was unbelievably a live human being buried in the mud with only his face showing above the surface. It was a nightmarish sight, truly incomparably creepy. A couple of merchants screamed in fright, holding on to each other. Shilian once again comforted them in a skilled and practiced manner. Don't panic. Everyone calm down. It's only a face, nothing extraordinary. We all have faces, no? That face chuckled. Oh, did I scare you? <laughs> I frequently scare myself, too. After reassuring the others, Shilian half crouched and examined this face in the mud. It was a man's face, quite flat when he wasn't smiling, but extremely wrinkled when he was. Shilian couldn't tell whether he was old or young and couldn't say whether he was handsome or not. He couldn't make much out of this face at all, so he simply asked directly, Who are you? The face in the mud asked back, Who are you? We're merchants passing through, Shilian replied. The mud face breathed a long sigh. Merchant passers by. I used to be part of a caravan, too, but that was 50, maybe 60 years ago. The situation just got 
freakier. Was a man buried in the grounds of an old city ruin for 50 or 60 years still human? One of the merchants shakily asked in trepidation, uh, Then how did a senior like yourself get here? The mud face cleared his throat and screwed up his face. I I was captured by the Banyue sol soldiers. I accidentally entered the city. They caught me and buried me here and made me the fertilizer for their Shenyue ferns. No wonder the herbs in their hands were big and full. They were fed with live humans. Thanks for this, MXTX, by the way. I don't think I thanked you for this yet. The merchants immediately dropped all the plants in their hands, feeling as though they were touching corpses. Shilian couldn't help but glance at his hand, too, but heard Senlung say, That one was fine. Of course, of course. He got the non-human fer fertilized one for his bay, you know. No wonder that, even though Senlung had looked through that field earlier, he left it to pick a small, almost withered fern from elsewhere. He probably saw what was in the soil and guessed that the herbs were grown with human fertilizer, so he ignored the lot completely and turned around and walked away until he found normally grown herbs in a remote area that was clean of corruption. Only after finding those herbs did he apply them to Shilian's hand. Senlung was considerate and careful. Thank you, truly, Shilian said. Senlung nodded his head, but his face was still gloomy. Ever since Shilian was stung by the scorpion snake, Senlung had behaved like this. A couple of days ago it was all Guga this, Guga that, but now he hardly called him Guga anymore. Other than sucking poison and applying herbs, Senlung seemed to be avoiding bodily contact with him as much as possible, and this thoroughly puzzled Shilian. Shilian couldn't grasp what he was thinking, and it was making him feel unsettled. Ironically enough, that might be one of the gayest paragraphs I've ever read. You know? Just then, the mud face began to speak again. I haven't seen real people in so many years. Can, can you come closer and let me see you all properly? Uh, no. Not on your very unfortunate life. The merchants all looked at each other, everyone thinking they'd best not do what he asked. After a while, seeing no one step forward, the mud face muttered, What? What, you don't want to? What a shame. Why is it a shame? Shilian turned and asked. There's something that's been bothering me ever since you all arrived, the mud face said, so I wanted to confirm with my own two eyes, which is why I asked you to stand closer to stand closer for why I asked you to stand closer for me to see. My brain really wanted to turn that into an entirely different sentence. I want to see each and every one of you clearly to make sure. To make sure of what? Shilian pressed. The mud face cackled. Don't be scared if I tell you. There's someone among you I've met before, 50 years ago. Hair raised on everyone's necks at that statement. If someone met this mud face 50 years ago, they'd be at least 60 or 70 by now. But among the people present, the oldest definitely didn't look older than 40. So how is that possible? Unless that person wasn't really a person. Shilian gave a sweeping look across everyone's faces, from A Zhao to Tian Sheng. Some were in shock, some stricken with fear, some shaking with anxiety some speechless and confused. Everyone's reaction was normal and within reason. If one had to pick the odd one out, it'd be San Lung. But for him, no reaction was probably the normal reaction. Shilian turned back to the mud face. Who is this person you speak of? The facial muscles of that mud face twitched and it gave an exceedingly freaky smile as if it was giving its all to make itself look more reliable, but it couldn't fully conceal the sinister smirk hiding beneath. He beckoned mysteriously. You, come closer, and I'll tell you. Shilian 
Shilian believed him 80% the first time the Mudface asked, but after this, only 50%. Who knew if this monster was only luring them closer to commit some evil deed? Of course, Shilian wouldn't listen to him. He got to his feet and was about to walk away when the Mudface raised his voice. Do you really not want to know who it is? He'll kill all of you the same way he killed us. So this is a good place to take a break because it's also a chapter break. We are now on page 279 at chapter 9, which was called... What? Called Dallying Hualien, Nightfall and Sinner's Pit. Hualien is the ship name. They're not even... I'm furious. Anyway... We're going to go ahead and take that break now. Um, it's 4.06. Uh, my back's feeling pretty good today. Uh, well, I mean, it is now 4.07. So we'll go ahead and say... Um, ooh, but 4.20 seems a little short. You know, we're going to go ahead and say uh, 4.15. It'll be a little bit of a short break today. Um, so I will be, hello, where's my bookmark? Thank you. I will be right back and we will start chapter nine.
and we are back. We are back for part two. I said that pretty loud. I probably just scared the shit out of a few people. I have a tendency to do that. My bad. But let's see if we can go ahead and pick up and see how far we can get, actually. We're making good time. It'd be great if we could actually pick up another, like, 20 pages or so. Oh, but just before we open back up and get started on Chapter 9, I just so happened to um, check the channel over the break. And today I hit 7,500 subscribers. I hit a little mini milestone there and i'm now like in my head kind of officially the better part of the way to like ten thousand. oh no i'm gonna get emotional uh -huh. this is supposed to be a happy thing so thank you very much to all of y'all it's so good to have you here it um 7500 kind of unreal and we're now like I guess from getting from 5k to potentially one day 10k, we are now at the halfway mark and stuff. And 10k's would be a big deal. This is a lovely step on the journey. I'm not going to get emotional. It's fine. I have to read. And when I get emotional, my throat closes. It's okay. I'm fine. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. That's kind of incredible and lovely of you all. I'm going to start chapter 9 now in an emotionally even-keeled state. So. Ooh. Ooh, Jamie, don't remind me. Jamie, Jamie the lovely just reminded me that, that my goal was to hit 5k by the end of the year. Don't do that to me. I'm fine. It's fine. I have to read. <laughs> it's okay. I'm fine. Anyway, chapter nine. Whew. All right. Whew. It's fine. It's okay. Chapter nine. Chapter nine. That literally has the ship name in the title because MXTX is unhinged. <sighs> Not me. I'm fine. Okay. <clears throat> the more adamant the mud face was, the more alarmed Shi Lian became. Everyone stand back, don't go near him, and don't listen to a single word he says. The crowd dispersed in a panic. The mud face continued to chuckle. Don't leave, there's no need to be like this. I'm a human too, I won't hurt you. Oh, you're mistaken. You look nothing like a human, Shi Lian thought. Just then, something unexpected happened. One of the merchants snuck back toward the field, probably thinking that he still had to bring back some herbs for the wounded. But when he bent down to pick up the ferns he had dropped in fright earlier, the mud face twisted and spotted him with a glint in its spinning eyes. Oh no, Shilian thought, rushing toward the man. Don't pick that up, come back! But it was too late. The mud face opened its mouth, and a long, blood-red thing slithered out. What a long tongue. Shilian grabbed the merchant by his collar and hustled backward with him in tow. But the tongue that flew out was freakishly long and forced its way right into the merchant's ear. We didn't need to get that descriptive, man. I could have, ooh, I could have done without that detail. Not really, that was, <coughs> savagely wonderful i just i just hate it i just hate it, it it's fine <coughs> shelian felt the body in his grip convulse violently the merchant's limbs writhed non-stop and the man let out a short agonizing scream before falling to the ground that long tongue dug out a large chunk of something bloody from his ear and brought it back to the mud face's mouth the mud face happily chewed and cackled, his laugh so disturbingly loud, it filled the entire palace grounds. 
Oh, it's so good. So good. So delicious. So delicious. So delicious. I was so hungry. So hungry. His voice was sharp and shrill. His eyes bloodshot, horrible and disgusting to the extreme. This man, who had been buried for over 50 years in the ground of an evil-filled kingdom, had already been molded into its soil and became something other than human. Shilian loosened his grip on the deceased merchant, his entire arm shaking. He was about to strike the repulsive monster when the mud face screamed again, General! General! They're here! They're here! Oh god, it's also an alarm system. A deafening cry, more savage than that of a beast's, echoed in the distance. A dark shadow dropped from the sky and landed heavily in front of Shilian. The entire palace grounds quaked on its landing. When it slowly stood up, its enormous shadow enveloped the entire group. This man was truly much too big. His face was as grim as steel, his expression ferocious and turbulent like that of a beast. He was at least three meters tall, clad in leather armor on his shoulders and chest. Rather than a man, one could say he was more like a walking wolf. Behind him, more and more similar forms appeared. One, two, three, over ten of those men jumped off the roofs of the palace and surrounded them. Each one of these men was as large as a horse, built like a beast, with a sharp, tooth-covered mace on his shoulder. They might as well have been werewolves. When they circled around the intruders in the garden, it was like a large steel cage had fallen upon them. The soldiers of Banyue. These soldiers emanated a dark aura and were undoubtedly no longer alive. Shilian was tense and held Royer in position, ready to attack. However, when the Banyue soldiers saw them, they didn't rush in to kill. Instead, they raised their heads and roared with crazed laughter, howling in a foreign language. The sound of their words was ghastly, guttural, and heavy with tongue rolling. That was the language of Banyue. Although it had been 200 years and Xilian had pretty much forgotten the language, he did review it with Sanlong earlier in the general's tomb. And the words uttered by these soldiers were loud, simple, and vulgar, so they weren't difficult to understand. He heard the soldiers call the first man general. Their conversation was filled with phrases like, take them away, and won't kill for now. Shilian took a deep breath to force himself to relax. He said in a low voice, everyone, don't panic. These Benue soldiers won't kill us for the time being. It seems they want to take us somewhere else. Don't do anything rash. I can't guarantee I can beat them in a fight. We'll figure this out as we go. You know, we'll play it by ear. <laughs> it was clear that these soldiers would be hard to fight, each of them rougher than the next. Even with Royer in hand, suffocating one would probably take a bit of time, never mind ten. With mortals with him, Shilian couldn't do anything bold and could only remain vigilant and protect them the best he could. Sanlong didn't say anything and the others had already lost their nerve. Even if they wanted to do something rash, they wouldn't know how, so they could only nod tearfully. Nod tearfully? I would have passed the fuck out. Who are you kidding? Next to them, the mud face screamed again, General! General! Please let me out! I detained your enemies! Let me go home! I want to go home! Seeing the Banyue soldiers, the mud face became hysterical, screaming and crying, blabbering nonsense with some Banyue words mixed in, no doubt learned from the many years he spent buried here. The massive nine-foot man they called General seemed to find the squirming mud face deeply disgusting and swung his mace toward it. He smashed the face into a bloody mess, the teeth of his mace piercing the brain. When he pulled his mace up again, the entire body was pulled out with it! fulfilling his wish of let me out. However, the body that was unearthed was not a full human body, but a chilling skeleton. The merchants screamed in terror. The mud face, bloody after crumpling off the mace, seemed to almost freeze in fear after seeing his own body. He sucked in a sharp breath. What's this? What's this? 
I now have a Nightmare Before Christmas song stuck in my head. Thank you very much. It's your body, Shelian reminded him, seeing that the mud face was numb in disbelief. It was easy to figure out. This man had been buried in the desert for more than 50 or 60 years. His body had fertilized the Shenyue ferns until they cleaned him of his flesh and left only bones. How can this be? the mud face cried. My body isn't like this. This is not my body. His voice was incomparably shrill, and he was a, and he was a horrifying and tragic sight. Shilian shook his head, but Sanlong sneered. Now you're not used to your own body? What was that thing that came out of your mouth earlier? You didn't think that was odd? The mud face countered immediately. That wasn't odd. It was ju just a tongue that's a bit longer than average. There was nothing but mockery on Sanlung's face. Yeah, sure. Just a little longer, right? Huh. That's right, the mud face cried. It's only a little bit longer. It's just because I spent decades trying to lift off insects, forcing my tongue to extend. That must be how it came to be like this. It's like the denial part of this that adds, like, a weird, terrifying psychological layer to this. The, just this whole, this whole concept is so super fucking freaky, but, like, really creative in, like, all the worst ways. And that's how you know you have a good horror concept. Oof. When he was first buried in the ground, perhaps he was still alive, and in order to survive, he had done his best to extend his tongue to eat flying insects and creepy crawlies. Then, as he gradually became less and less human, his tongue also became longer and longer, and the food he ate also moved from insects to much more terrifying things. However, because he had been buried underground for so many years, unable to see the state of his body, he was unable to accept the truth and refused to believe he was no longer human. The mud face kept trying to argue. There are plenty of people who have long tongues, not just me. Sanlung smiled, and Shi Lian felt a chill watching him. This youth's smile really gave off a sense of cruelty, like he was on the verge of ripping off someone's face. Do you think you're still human? Sanlong questioned. The mud face felt a sense of danger at the question, and suddenly became agitated. Of course I'm human! I'm human! The mud face screamed and tried to move his white, bony limbs all at once, as if trying to crawl away. Finally, on Earth, he was mad with joy, cackling, I'm going home! I can go home now! Crack! The Banyue general finally had enough of this monster's shrill cries. In a split second, he crushed the bones in one stomp, killing any more of his cries of I'm human. After trampling the irritating mud face, the general roared at the soldiers. The Benue soldiers all raised their maces and, growling at Xilian's group, started herding them out of the palace. Xilian walked up front with Sanlong still following close behind. Despite being ushered by ruthless Benue soldiers, the youth's step was still light and casual, as if he were taking a stroll. Xilian had been hoping to find a chance to talk to him, and after a while, when the Benue soldiers went back to conversing among themselves, he spoke to Sanlong in a low voice. Those Benue soldiers call their, general, call their leader General. I wonder who it is. As expected, when he posed a question, Sanlong still answered. At the time when the kingdom of Benue fell, there was only one general. His name, translated, is Kimo. Kimo? As in Millstone? Shilian wondered at the odd name. That's right, Sanlong said. Apparently, it was because he was awfully weak when he was young and was often bullied. He rallied and built up his strength by training with large millstones, which is how he got his name. Shilian couldn't resist, thinking, then he could have just as easily been named Dali for brawn. Sanlong continued, Legends have it that Kimo was the strongest warrior in the history of Banyue, three meters tall and extremely powerful. He was a loyal supporter of the state preceptor. Even after death? Is he talking to... Is he taking us to the Banyue State Preceptor now, then? Shilian asked. Perhaps, Senlung replied. If there were more Banyue soldiers there, how would they escape? Who knew how Nanfeng, who had lured the other two away, was doing? The Shenyue fern was in their hands, but how are they going to deliver the ferns to the wounded 
within 24 hours. Shilian contemplated as he walked and soon noticed that General Kimo was leading them to a remote place at the far end of the city. When they stopped and Shilian looked up, a colossal yellow earthen wall stood before him like a giant. Their destination was the Sinner's Pit. Although Shilian had lived in the Banyue area for a time, he had rarely gone into town and had never gone near the Sinner's Pit. Seeing it this close, Shilian's heart started pounding for some reason. The yellow earthed walls had had a set of stairs along the outside. While they slowly climbed the crude stairs, Shilian scrutinized the pit and tried to look with his human eyes into the depths until he finally understood why his heart was pounding. It wasn't because of thoughts of how this was a place of torture and cruelty, and it wasn't his worry about everyone getting pushed in. He was feeling the palpitations of a very powerful array at work. Someone had purposely set up an incredibly powerful array using the sinner's pit's surrounding terrain and structure, and this array only had one purpose, to prevent the fallen from ever resurfacing. What that meant was, even if a rope or a ladder was sent down into the pit, whoever tried to climb from the bottom would get cut, would get cut off halfway up and thrown right back down. Without outwardly showing his intent, Shilian used the wall as support to climb up the stairs. After walking for a stretch, he determined the material of the wall. He discovered that, while it looked like it was made of earth, it was actually inc incomparably hard stone, preferably enforced with a layer, preferably, probably enforced with a layer of magic. It undoubtedly, <clears throat> woo, reset. It'd undoubtedly be very difficult to break. Oh, there's art for you. Hang on, we'll get there. When they reached the end of the stairs and came to the top of the pit, standing along the wall's eaves, the only word to describe the sight was awful. That, that is, it inspired awe. The whole of the sinner's pit was formed by four great walls surrounding it. Each wall was over 100 meters long, over 60 meters high, and over a meter thick, the structure standing solemnly tall. At the top of each wall there was nothing, neither gazebos nor railings. Within the enclosure there was a deep abyss without a bottom in sight. With the growing night there was only blackness and a chilling smell of blood wafting up from below. No one dared look down while walking along the railingless eaves tens of meters above the ground. After a while they could see the pole that stood in the center, and attached to that pole was a hanging corpse the same one they had spotted before. The corpse was a small, black-clad girl, her clothing tattered and head bowed. Some art here, just some very lovely, not at all creepy and terrifying art. Look at that. That's very evocative. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, it almost reminds me of the style of that children's horror book series. If you know what I'm talking about, you automatically know. I'm blanking on the name, but the art was creepier than the stories. The stories were actually kind of stupid, but the art was terrifying. This kind of reminds me of that style, actually. Something about the strips of cloth. Now I've got to reorient everything so that I'm not looking at two versions of me. Okay. Uh, scary stories to tell in the dark. Yes, thank you, Ellen. Yes, yes. You can Google that art. It's infamous at being just horrifying. <coughs> Shilian knew that this pole had been used specifically for hanging criminals that deserved shame and humiliation. The prison guards would usually strip the criminals of their clothing and hang the bodies naked. The criminals would die from starvation or dehydration, and after death the corpse would be left to flail in the wind, scorch under the sun, and rot in the rain. When the corpse rotted completely through, it would fall into the pit itself. That sort of death was an exceedingly ugly sight. The corpse of that girl didn't seem to be rotten, so it must not have been long since she died. Perhaps it was a local girl that the soldiers captured. What a cruel and vulgar thing to do to a young girl. Ajao, Tan Sheng, and the others' faces blanched at the sight 
and paused in their steps, afraid to go forward. Kimo didn't force them onward either, but turned to the pit and let out a long cry. Why is he yelling? Shilian wondered, but his question was soon answered. From the bottom of the dark pit, there came wave after wave of roars in response to the cry. Like predatory beasts, like monsters, like tsunamis, hundreds upon thousands deafening to the ear. The walls trembled with the noise, making those standing on the eaves lose their balance. Shilian could clearly hear rocks and debris fl falling within. Only criminals were thrown into the sinner's pit. Were those the souls of the criminals answering Kimo? Kimo roared again, and Shilian paid more attention, listening. This time, Kimo wasn't making meaningless noise, and he wasn't cursing either. Instead, he was giving encouragement. Shilian was very sure he heard the words, My brothers. After roaring, Kimo turned to the soldiers watching Shilian and the others and shouted another command. Shilian understood. Kimo had said, Just throw in two and detain the rest. The others might not have understood what was being said, but the intent of those soldiers was not hard to guess. Everyone looked pale as ghosts. Shilian saw that a couple couldn't even stand upright anymore, shaking from fear. He stepped forward and said in a small voice, Don't worry, if anything happens, I will go first. Shilian thought that if they all must fall, he might as well be the first one to check things out. It couldn't be worse than venomous snakes and beasts or menacing ghosts. He couldn't die from the fall, from getting beaten, from bites, or from poison. As long as it wasn't lava or fire, or some pool of corpse-dissolving water, it shouldn't be too terrible when he jumped down. Did he not- was he not there for the description? That really good description, by the way, that was highly effective and terrifying? Did-, did was he not listening to me? Jesus. Besides, he had Roye with him. Even if he might not manage to escape the array, he could still use it to catch the others who fell after him. Kimo had said detain the rest, meaning that most of the others should be safe temporarily. After all, it wasn't easy hunting for prey in the Gobi Desert, so they should savor them instead of eating everyone in one go. Shilian's mind was clear, but who knew there was someone next to him who couldn't wait any longer? Ever since they reached the top of the sinner's pit, everyone, besides Senlung, who looked like nothing was out of the ordinary, was trembling, but especially Ajao. He must have thought that if he was about to die, he might as well go down fighting. He clenched his fists and suddenly revolted. He went charging toward Kimo with his head down. The charge looked like Ajao was ready to perish, but wanted to take Kimo down with him by knocking them both into the pit. Even though Kimo was the bigger of the two, strong like a steel tower, he got pushed back three steps from Ajao's desperation. He roared in outrage and immediately threw the young man in. Everyone started screaming when they saw Ajao plunge into the dark abyss, and Shilian called after him too, Ajao! From deep within the bottomless pit, there came a roaring cheer, and then sounds of the cruel ripping of flesh, like fierce ghosts fighting over a meal. It was easy to understand from hearing those noises that the young man, Ajao, would never survive. Shilian was dumbstruck by this development. He had been suspicious that Ajao was a subordinate of the Banyue State Preceptor, purposely leading travelers to the ruins. He also suspected that he was the one who was here 50 or 60 years ago, but the young man ended up being the first killed. How could he possibly survive that jump? Could he be faking his own death? But now they were all captured by the Banyue soldiers. If Ajao really was the state preceptor's subordinate, he'd have the upper hand and could gloriously reveal his true identity. Certainly, he didn't need to do anything extra, like faking his own death before their eyes. It was completely meaningless. But then, why did Ajao rush Kimo? Wasn't that an equally meaningless death? Shilian's thoughts were in knots again, while the Banyue soldiers decided on the next human to push down. Kimo sized them up and pointed at Tan Sheng. Another Banyue soldier opened his large palm and reached out to capture the boy. Tenjung screamed in terror. Help! Don't take me! I'm... Without any more time to think, Shilian stepped forward, 
Please wait, General. Hearing him speak, and in the Benue tongue no less, shock appeared on Kimo's dark-skinned face. You know how to speak our tongue? Where are you from? I'm from the Central Plains, Shilian replied. He would have been fine with lying that he was also a citizen of Benue, but that wouldn't have worked. With how rusty his Benue dialect was, his lie would fall apart after conversing with Kimo for too long. Besides, it was also obvious from his appearance that he was a man of the Central Plains. The people of Benue detested liars more than anything, so if Shilian was found out, the result would be much worse. Central Plains? Kimo questioned. Descendants of Yong'an? No, Shilian replied. The kingdom of Yong'an has long since fallen. There's no more Yong'an now. But to those of Benue, all those who came from the Central Plains were pretty much the same. Relatives of the descendants of Yong'an. The Benue were annihilated by the army of Yong'an, so the moment he heard where Shilian was from, Kimo's dark expression flashed with rage. Many of the Benue soldiers also started growling, cursing vulgarly at him. Shilian listened, but it wasn't much more than despicable, liar, and throw him down. Shilian couldn't care less. Kimo demanded, Our kingdom disappeared in the Gobi over 200 years ago. You are not of our people. Why do you know our tongue? Who are you? Shilian couldn't help but steal a glance at the calm youth behind him, mentally hoping that if his lies fell apart later, maybe he could shamelessly ask Sanlong to save him. He cleared his throat and was ready to start jabbering nonsense when another series of enraged growls sounded from below. It seemed that whatever was down in the pit had finished ripping Ajao apart, but they were still hungry for more and cried out to convey their thirst for fresh blood. Kimo waved his hand again, ready to have Tian Sheng thrown over, so Shi Lian spoke up. General, please take me first. Kimo must have never heard anyone request to go first before, and his eyes bulged like balls. He demanded in disbelief, You go first, why? Shi Lian couldn't tell him the truth and say it was because he wasn't scared. He thought for a second and came up with a logical answer. General, they are innocent passing merchants. There's even a child among them. Kimo sneered. When your young An army annihilated my kingdom, do you think we did not also have innocent merchants and children? The fall of the kingdom of Banyue was over 200 years ago, and since then countless dynasties had come and gone. However, these were the dead for whom time had stopped. Hatred and grudges would not fade with the changing times. Kimo continued, You're very suspicious. I will need to question you. You're not going down. Throw in a different one. There was no helping it. Shilian was ready to jump if all else failed anyway. However, behind him, Sanlong stepped forward. Shilian's heart lurched, and he looked back. With his arms crossed, the youth was nonchalantly looking down into the dark, bottomless sinner's pit with an intrigued air. This wasn't a good sign. Shilian called out, Sanlong? Sanlong looked over at the sound of his call and smiled softly. It's fine. He took another step forward and was teetering dangerously on the brink. Both Shi Lian's head and heart started pounding. He called again, Wait, Senlong, don't move! At such a height, at the very edge of the pit, the hem of the youth's red clothes danced in the night breeze. Senlong glanced at him again with a smile. Don't be scared. You... Come back here first. Come back here and I won't be scared, Shilian said. Don't worry. I'm just going to leave for a bit. We'll see each other again soon, Senlong said. Don't! Before he finished, the boy took another step forward, his arms still crossed. Then, with a light leap, he instantly vanished into the unfathomable darkness. Motherfucker. Ooh, ooh, I'm torn. I'm torn. We're getting to where we need to stop. But I would really like to try to get to page 300. That would put us on perfect track to finish in another two cent, uh, two sessions. But that was a perfect cliffhanger. <sighs> Screw it. We're going to try to go for 300 in the next few minutes we're on page we're at the top of page 293 by the way so it's not like totally without the realm of possibility we're just gonna have to we're gonna go we're gonna go we're gonna go also yeah you've like known him two days Shilian. can we like this like 
heartfelt, like, pained, like, don't, and then San Long pulling his hot guy shit and just being like, it's fine. I have a pleasing baritone. And just hopping in. Like, what the? These fools. These two. These two fools. <sighs> Top of 293. The moment he jumped, Roye shot out from Shilian's wrist and transformed into a streak of white, trying to grab hold of the youth's form. Yet the plunge was too fast, and the white silk band returned dispiritedly without even a sleeve corner. Yo, how are they gonna make... How are they gonna fucking make Roye a just... a, a silk band? Cute. What's that? Also, MXTX, by the way. Shilian fell to his knees at the edge of the wall and screamed, Sen Lung! My god! Two days! Not a single sound. After Sen Lung jumped, there was not a single sound. Next to him, many of the Benue soldiers started yelling instead, all dumbfounded and bewildered. What was wrong with today? In the past, they'd always had to catch their prey and throw them into the pit. But tonight, their prey took turns fighting to jump down on their own, and when held back, they jumped anyway. General Kimo yelled for them to calm down. As for Shi Lian, when he saw that Roye didn't catch Sun Long, he didn't waste any time thinking before pulling back the silk band and taking a leap off the wall himself. But when his body was still in midair, he felt his collar tighten and he stayed in place. Shilian looked back. It turned out that when General Kimo saw him jump, he reached out and grabbed Shilian by the collar, preventing his fall. If you want to join me, that's fine too. Best if we go down together, Shilian urged with his mind. And like a snake, Roye shot out once more. It wrapped itself up Kimo's arm and roped his whole body. Seeing that the white silk band was unpredictably deadly and spirited, Kimo's veins popped, and his muscles instantly swelled as if trying to forcibly rip the fabric tying him. Shilian was at an impasse with Kimo when he saw something peculiar out of the corner of his eye. The corpse hanging on the pole suddenly jerked and raised her head slightly. The band of Benue's soldiers also saw the corpse move and started yelling, swinging their maces to attack it. But the black-clad girl somehow untied herself and hopped off the pole before speeding toward them. You want to talk about a plot twist? You want to talk about a beautifully executed plot twist? Just a subtle move, and now all of a sudden she's moving, and you're like, holy hell, she's moving? She's alive? Amazing. Just amazing. I hate MXT, but she's amazing. Oh, I hate her. 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 She was like a black wind blowing through the eaves, fast and wicked. The soldiers couldn't maintain their balance and were quickly swept into the sinner's pit, one by one, screaming. Outraged, Kimo yelled extreme vulgarities at her, many of which were street slang that Shilian couldn't understand well. But he did understand the first words. It's that bitch again! The swearing ceased in the next moment because Shilian suddenly yanked Kimo over to fall into the sinner's pit with him. Into the inescapable sinner's pit. While falling, Kimo roared with such fury that it almost killed Shilian's eardrums. He had to recall Roye and give Kimo a kick while he was at it to get the general farther away from him just to protect his ears. Soon after, he urged Roye to fly upward to try to grab hold of anything that could prevent him from falling deeper, or to slow him enough that when he hit the ground it wouldn't be too painful. However, the sinner's pit was formidably built and had an equally powerful array at work. So not only couldn't Roye reach higher, it also couldn't find anything to hold on to. Shilian thought he was going to crash and flatten like a pancake as he had many times before, when suddenly in the darkness there was a flash of silver. The next moment, a pair of hands caught him lightly. I'd forgotten about this. Whoever it was. Really? Really? Whoever? Just whoever it was? Just, you know, whoever it could possibly fucking be. I'm so incensed, I lost my place. There it is.
whoever it was, caught him perfectly, as if they were waiting there at the bottom just to catch him. With a hand across his back to grasp his shoulders and another under his knees to support his weight, they easily dissolved the devastating force of the fall. Shelian had just fallen from such a high place and with such a forceful stop that he was still somewhat dizzy and confused. He subconsciously reached out and held tightly onto the person's shoulders. San Lang, he called out. It was dark all around and nothing could be seen, including the person holding him. But still, he blurted out that name. The person didn't respond, so Shilian felt around their shoulders and chest, hoping to confirm. Senlong, is that you? Maybe it was because the stench of blood here at the bottom of the pit was heavy and disorienting. Who knew what was going through Shilian's head, but his hands continued to roam upward until he reached a strong, hard Adam's apple. Stop it! He snapped out of it in shock and immediately reprimanded himself, withdrawing his hands. It's Sen Lung, right? Are you all right? Are you hurt? It took a moment before he heard the youth respond in a deep, low voice from somewhere very close to him. I'm fine. For some reason, Shilian thought that his voice was curiously different from before. Sen Lung, are you really all right? Put me down, Shilian said. No. Sen Lung replied. Shilian was taken aback by the response. What was going on? Was there something on the ground? That pair of arms was still holding him tightly without any intention of letting him go. Shilian raised his hand and was about to gently push himself away. However, just as he laid his hand on Sen Lung's chest, he abruptly remembered how after he was caught from the fall, his hands had roamed and felt up that Hard protrusion on the youth's neck. He quietly withdrew his hand again. Shilian didn't know what was up. It had been hundreds of years since the last time Shilian cared about being awkward, but now there was a voice in his head telling him that he'd better stay still and proper to behave himself. <clears throat> Just then, there was an enraged, sorrowful wail and a sharp voice from the other end of the pit roared, What happened to you? Those words were shouted in the Banyue language, and from the voice it was General Kimo that Shilian had dragged down with him. Since he was already dead, the fall wouldn't have killed him. It was a violent crash, however, so he probably blasted out a human-shaped crater in the ground with him embedded, and once he climbed out, he started yelling, What's going on? My brothers, what happened to you? When he roared into the pit earlier from the top of the wall, there were hundreds and thousands of voices that answered his call, as if the pit was filled to the brim with angry, menacing ghosts. But right then and there, other than Kimo's cries, Shilian could only hear dead silence. There wasn't even any sound of breathing, or that of a heartbeat, from San Lang right next to him. Shilian's breath hitched, suddenly realizing what was amiss. That's right. Even though Shilian was pressed against Sha San Lang, which I, mm, mm, he couldn't detect the sounds of his beating heart or his breath. Kimo roared, Who killed you? Who was it? When Ajao first fell, there were horrifying sounds of flesh being ripped apart. But after San Lang jumped, there was no more noise. Who else could have done it? Kimo himself must have realized this, and he shouted toward them. Killing my soldiers? You're dead. I'm going to kill you. Although he couldn't see, Shilian could still sense danger rapidly approaching and jerked. San Lang, watch out! Don't worry about him, San Lang said, still holding Shilian tight. He made a small sidestep and spun around. In the dark, Shilian heard a series of fine clinking sounds, pleasant to the ear, clear and intense, swishing here and there. Kimo pounced to capture them, but missed the first time. He whirled around to lunge again, but San Lung easily sidestepped and dodged him again. Shilian's arms involuntarily climbed up San Lung's chest once more and held on tight to his shoulders, subconsciously clutching at his clothes. But the arms carrying him were steady because... <laughs> yeah. 
mm, I'm having a normal reaction to all of this. Even with all of the spinning and sidestepping, the hold was still strong and secure. Shilian could feel something cold and hard on those arms that would poke at him every so often, and was a little confused. In the endless blackness, streaks of shimmering silver flashed everywhere, and the sounds of sharp metal slicing wounds into flesh were accompanied by Kimo's angry roars. It was obvious that, ba that the Banyue general was heavily wounded by now, but as tough as he was, he refused to admit defeat, and once again rushed toward them. Shilian called out, Roye! The silk band answered his call and shot out. A loud snap sa sounded above them. Kimo seemed to have been whipped high up in, in the air, then flipped and dropped to the ground. This fall made Kimo roar angrily. You two! Two against one! Despicable! You were gonna kill us! Who cares if it's two against one? Or despicable or not? Saving my life is more important, and I'll kill you dead first, Shi Lian thought. <laughs> San Lung, on the other hand, only humped a merciless snort. Even one-on-one, -on -one, you won't win. You don't have to fight. The last line was directed to Shi Lian, who, in speaking it, his voice was deeper, with none of the previous glib, mocking tone. All right, Shi Lian responded, but also prompted him, San Lung, why don't you put me down? I'll be in your way like this. You're not in the way. Don't get down, San Lung said. Why can't I get down? Shilian asked in spite of himself. This guy couldn't possibly enjoy fighting while carrying someone, could he? He didn't need to go that far to look down on his on his opponent, did he? Senlong's answer was only two words. It's dirty. <sighs> Shilian had never imagined that would be the answer, and said with such seriousness, too. He thought it was a little funny, but it also made him feel inexplicably strange. His chest, growing slightly warm for some reason, some unknowable reason, some completely unpredictable, not at all foreseeable, totally mysterious reason. It's simply unfathomable. We have no idea. You can't possibly keep holding me like this. I could, San Lung replied. Shilian was only joking, but San Lung's reply had no trace of humor. Suddenly, Shilian didn't know how to respond. Girl, me neither. While they were talking, Kimo never ceased attacking. Both of San Lung's hands were holding him firmly, but something else was keeping Kimo at bay, whipping him to his defeat. While slowly backing off, he shouted, That bitch made you two. He hadn't yet finished his words when a large boom sounded. The massive man fell to the ground, beaten to the point where he could no longer stand. Having heard this, Shilian said, San Lang, don't kill him. We st we'll still need to question him if we want to get out of here. San Lang indeed stopped his attacks and remained still. I wasn't planning on killing him anyway. Otherwise, he wouldn't have lasted till now. Oh, again with this hot guy shit. Dead silence returned anew to the bottom of the sinner's pit. After a moment, Shilian asked, San Lung, were you the one who did all of this down here? Even if nothing was visible in the... Oh my god, that's right! <gasps> I forgot about this too! Even if nothing was visible in the, in the dark, with such an overpowering stench of blood, such an aura of bloodlust, and Kimo's madness and rage, it was obvious what, had hap what happened down here. There was another momentary silence before Shilian heard San Lung's response. Yes he said. It was the expected answer. Shilian sighed. How should I say this? Shilian chewed on his words and organized his thoughts before continuing in an earnest tone. San Lung, next time you see a pit like this, don't just jump in randomly. I couldn't even stop you. Really, I didn't know what to do. San Lung didn't seem to expect that kind of response and was stumped for a moment. When he spoke again, he sounded a bit odd. You don't want to ask anything else? What else do you want me to ask? Shilian said. For example, whether I'm human, San Lung replied. Shilian rubbed his forehead. Hmm, I don't think that's necessary. Is it not? Is it? It's not important whether you're human or not, Shilian said. Oh? 
Julian crossed his own arms while being held in Sun Lungs and replied, Forming a friendship should depend on how well two people hit it off and how well their personalities match, not their identities. If I like you, you could be a beggar and I'd still like you. If I dislike you, you could be the emperor and I'd still dislike you. Shouldn't it be like that? It's simple logic. So whether you're human or not is irrelevant. Jesus, I just fell in love with you, Shilian. What the fuck? Senlong laughed out loud. Yeah, you're very right. Right, Shilian said, laughing along too. But the more he laughed, the more he felt something was off, and it came to him suddenly. He was still letting Sanlang carry him. And the scary thing was, he had gotten used to being in this position without realizing it. This was going to be the death of him. I know the bitch means this literally somehow, and I'm going to scream at her whenever that fucking happens. <sighs> Shilian cleared his throat quietly and said, Um, Senlang, we can talk about that later. Why don't you put me down first? Senlang seemed to have flashed a smile and said, Hold on. He carried Shilian and walked on for a bit before gently setting him down. When Shilian was back on his own two feet, he could feel hard, flat ground. Thanks! Senlang made no gesture in response, and after thanking him, Shilian gazed upward. In the deep blue sky, there hung a brilliant crescent moon, exceptionally beautiful. It was just that it was framed by a squared-off sky that made him feel like a frog stargazing in a well. Shilian tried urging Roye to reach for the top again, but as expected, it only leapt up halfway before it was stopped by something invisible and rebounded, unable to go higher. There's an array drawn around the sinner's pit, Senlang said. I know, I just wanted to give it a try, Shilian said. I can't give up until I've tried, you know. I wonder how the others are doing up there. Will that girl in black also sweep them down? He recounted to Senlung how the girl who was hanged on the pole suddenly escaped and swept all the soldiers down into the pit. While talking, he stepped on something on the ground. It appeared to be an arm, and Shilian almost tripped. He steadied himself immediately, but Senlung still reached out and helped support him, chiding, Be careful. I told you the ground was dirty, Senlung added casually. Shilian now understood what dirty meant and said, It's fine. I want to ignite a palm torch, see what's happened down here and go from there. Senlang didn't respond. Just then, from afar, Kimo's cold voice bellowed again. You two, doing the bidding of that bitch, the thousands of wronged souls of this kingdom, will curse you. Shilian turned toward Kimo and asked, using the Banue tongue, General Kimo, who is that person you speak of? Kimo replied hatefully. Why pretend to ask? That evil cultivator. Is it the female cultivator who roams the city streets? Kimo spat angrily on the ground, and Shilian took that as a yes. He continued to question, Weren't you a loyal supporter of the Banyue State Preceptor? Kimo was provoked by his words and yelled, I, Kimo, will never again be loyal to her. I can never forgive that bitch. A long string of curses followed. Kimo was hysterical and spoke rapidly, so fast that Shilian blanked out at the end, unable to follow. He quietly whispered, Senlang, Senlang. And so Senlang translated, He's cursing. He says that woman betrayed his country, opened the city gates, and let the young An army into slaughter. She's got the blood of her people on her hands, and of his brothers who she pushed into this pit. He will hang her dead a thousand times. Ten thousand times. And that has to be where we stop. I am late. We have run just a little bit late to make sure that we are in prime optimal position and this continues to be thoroughly compelling from top to bottom but i'm late i gotta go vote the wife is home so thank you so much for hopping along for hopping along hopping onto the stream for this part of the book i will see you guys on thursday same time and then after that there should only be one more uh one more session before we're actually done with volume one so we should be done next Tuesday, right? Like a week from now. Yeah. So hopefully you guys can make it. But of course, if you can't, no worries. These live streams get published the second that they end. So there's no waiting or anything. If you have to miss one, not that big of a deal. So I will see you guys on Thursday. And um, please, please, please 
take care of yourselves. And also, once again, if you're American, please go vote today. <laughs> I will see you guys on Thursday.